Thank you. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Professor Fred Moten. Professor Fred Moten will deliver this year's Steiner Lecture. A scholar and a poet, Professor Moten is currently Professor of Performance Studies at New York University. And he is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at University of California, Riverside, has also taught at Duke University, Brown University, and the University of Iowa. And I would be remiss not to mention that his poetic work, The Field Trio, from 2014, garnered him the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Award. He was also awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, popularly known as the Genius Grant, forgive me, <laughs> for, and I quote, creating new conceptual spaces to accommodate emerging forms of black aesthetics, cultural production, and social life. Much more could be said about his pioneering work and his many titles listed, but I'll limit myself to a note of personal privilege. Professor Moten has no idea about this, but I met, well, this he knows, of course. I met Professor Moten at Princeton University when I was completing my graduate studies, and this is what he didn't and doesn't know. It was this offhand remark he made about Kant, Kant's geography, and the technological spatialization of the globe that gave me the idea that I didn't know I needed to complete that heavy assignment. I trust that in the talk to follow, titled The Gorgeous Nothings, Dickinson, Plato, and the Philosophical Blues, others too, as I certainly did, will find in Professor Moten a unique source of intellectual inspiration. Please join me in welcoming Professor Fred Moten. Um, thank you, Professor Wilson. And uh, I want to thank everybody um, who's made it possible for me to be here tonight. It's just a real pleasure. I want to thank um, Veronica, I don't know if she's here, for helping me with the logistics. And last night when I was wandering around looking confused, Calvin Bright helped me find the Pritzker Center. <laughs> Everybody's just been uh, very, very friendly and very welcoming um, from the initial invitation up to this moment. And, um, and I have to say, I've never, <laughs> no one's ever stood up when I walked into a room before, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a little freaked out. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm gonna try to get over it. Um, I, I feel like, um, you know, the respect that all of you have here, students and, and faculty, and administration, staff, the respect that you have for thinking um, is so palpable um, that, um, that it really literally is something that you feel like you can breathe in, um, e even at this high altitude. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm very, very thankful to be here, even though I guess I should also say that I'm a little intimidated about being here too. Um, and in fact, it's the intimidation that was you know, other beyond Professor Wilson's kind invitation, it was the the risk of being intimidated. It was the most uh, attractive thing. Um, usually, when you give a lecture, the the general understanding is that you know more about what you're talking about than the people who are in the audience. And um, in this instance, I I have a feeling that the reverse is true. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think um, probably the most ubiquitous mark um, in this uh, developing manuscript is a question mark. I have a lot of questions, which I hope you can not necessarily answer, but, but help me to address. 
and and I should say that as much as I want to be um, absolutely respectful of the traditions that you um, that you that you engage in and honor here, I do have one request. It's not a demand. It's just a request, and that is that if anybody has an urge to answer to ask a question, or you feel confused or annoyed by something that I say, don't don't wait to the Q&A, um, just, just blurt it out right now. <laughs> um, it'll, it'll help, right? And in fact, it is in fact this question of, let's say, what we might call the, um, the protocols of study, that's a, a big part of what I'm interested in trying to talk about um, today, tonight. Um, it, it, even, it even manifests itself with regard to the whole problem of lecturing in the first place. Um, my, I have two, two teenage kids who still can't get their minds wrapped around the fact that sometimes people invite me to lectures. <laughs> um, they, <laughs> they're so sick of it now. Um, <clears throat> but, but, I, but I'm at the same time that I am, let's say, given to lecturing that it probably, and certainly they would say that it is my primary mode of, of interaction. <laughs> I'm also very, very reticent about lecturing, particularly insofar as it feels like it's a betrayal of the sense of pedagogical responsibility that I, that I definitely want to take up. Um, it's this complicated thing, right? How do you, if you know something is true, and you know something is good, you, you just want to tell somebody, right? You just, you just want to share it. <laughs> you don't really just want to share it, you want to impose it. <laughs> um, and yet, if most of what you think of under the rubric of good has to do with the refusal of imposition at any kind, it produces a conundrum that is just about impossible to, to work oneself out of. Um, and often, this conundrum manifests itself as a particular problem regarding the distinction between seeming to be good and actually being good. Um, people nowadays in, in certain political circles talk about this under the rubric of performativity. Um, or virtue signaling. And some of what I guess I want to talk about a little bit today is the problem of political and philosophical performativity and virtue signaling as it manifests itself in this great and exasperating dialogue by Plato um, called Gorgias. And, and that's one of the things I guess I'm a little um, I tried to take Greek in, uh, in college. I knew I should. I knew I needed it. I knew it would be good for me. But, and it was good for me um, for that one day <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that, I, uh, that I lasted in the intensive summer Greek workshop. But um, so I don't know that, uh, but I, 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 I just, you know, I, I, <laughs> It was like uh, I just got knocked out. You know, I tried to get up, but I just I just couldn't make it by the count of ten. Um, so I don't even know if I'm pronouncing these words right. I don't know if anybody knows the right pronunciation. Um, but a lot of what it is that I want to say today is predicated on the idea that that um, G O R G I A S is um sounds pretty much like g o r g e o u s okay so all right um so in my description and i'll repeat it now i'm hoping that we can conduct what i guess i'm calling a kind of para philological thought experiment in which we look for traces of gorgeous um the 
the ancient Greek philosopher or sophist, depending on how you look at it, um, in which we look for traces of, of a lost work of his um, called On Nature or the Non-Existent in the folds of Emily Dickinson's envelopes. Perhaps our findings will provide some occasion to celebrate and cultivate the mystical, poetical, and sophistical field that causes philosophy, but which also causes so much trouble for philosophy. It even, I guess I would want to say, gives philosophy the blues. Um, it's, it's, it causes a certain depression for philosophy. Um, it turns out that this blues has something to do with, with resolution or the desire for it and determination or the desire for that. And these can be considered both musically and philosophically. And this is something that shows up and, and operates not just in the dialogue um, called Gorgias, but also in the Phaedrus as well, um, where Socrates, um, in, 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 a, in a in a moment that is replicated relatively frequently throughout the dialogues, declares his love for what um, he calls, or at least what is translated as, divisions and collections. Um, and I would even argue that he's also implicitly declaring his love for sublation as well. And I'm interested in what Dickinson might be said to hold against that love. Um, and let's say that part of what it is that she holds against it is dissonance and, and irresolution and indetermination or indeterminacy. For Dickinson, poetry was inextricable from correspondence and from a kind of regular practice of writing that got all the way down to the materiality of the paper itself. Dickens, Dickinson's critics over the course especially of the last, I would say, 40 years, particularly in the wake of one extraordinarily path-breaking and faithful critic of hers who's also a great poet by the name of Susan Howe. Dickinson's work has, as you know, let's say, increasingly been the subject of a kind of salvage or rescue operation in which not only is her persona as an artist rescued from some of the orthodoxies of of normative Dickinson criticism. And let's say that those orthodoxies begin in the work of an interlocutor of hers, uh, who in some ways was a kind of uh, introduction to something like a, a literary world, at least for a brief moment, the, the writer and abolitionist Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Um, it, that one of the common places of, of this sort of orthodox Dickinson criticism is that it was the job of Dickinson's critics to correct her. Okay. Not only to correct her idiosyncrasies as a writer, but also to correct idiosyncrasies in her text. And those idiosyncrasies were often just seen as mistakes or random marks, um, just, or just, you know, the, the, the hallmarks of a figure who for whatever reason, did not seem to be concerned with a normative sense of, of what constitutes publication. Right. And in this respect, what people did was that they took those elements of the text that might indicate its unfinishedness and simply eliminated them from the text in order to produce an illusion of finishedness, an illusion of resolution. Okay. Um, in this respect, Dickinson's work was sort of disqualified from the intensity of its own sort of historical um, radicalness, right? So that one way to think about Dickinson is that she's an early precursor of the kind of work that by the 1950s was being valorized uh, in, in, the, in the work of poets like, well, first H.D., but also Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, Robert Duncan, Charles Olson. Um, and, and it is in Olson's work and Duncan's work in particular that this, that this new poetics kind of took on a name and the name was an open field poetics. Okay. So Dickinson is seen usually as somebody who is not, you know, let's say a part of that tradition. Instead, she's often replaced within that literary tradition or that sense of the literary tradition by Whitman. Right? 
It's not that Whitman doesn't have a place in it, it's just that Dickinson has a place in it too. And it was the work of Susan Howe especially, which began to try to do the remedial work of allowing Dickinson to have that place. Okay. Now, the thing is, is um, Dickinson's strangeness, her weirdness, seems to me to be so profound that even it has to be rescued from the people who are attempting to rescue it. Right? <laughs> like it's even way more out than, than people want to say. Um, and, and I think, and there's a second wave of critics in the, in the wake of Howe who have begun to do that work. Um, there's a couple in particular that I'm interested in and that I'll quote tonight, one named Jan Bervin, and the other named Marta Werner. And it's interesting that these are folks who are, you know, they certainly have deep, deep literary critical sensibilities and sensitivities, but they are also, um, also folks who are in some ways primarily trained in, in visual art, which is to say that when they look at Dickinson's work, they really look at the work as if it should be looked at rather than immediately read, right? right. It's not that reading is a bad thing or a, or a debilitating thing, but there is a moment in which it is useful to be reminded that before you can read something, you have to look at it. And not only that, that before you, that in the relay between looking at it and reading it, other possibilities of looking emerge. For instance, the possibility of something like looking with rather than simply looking at, which then means that the poem, even as a kind of visual object, begins to veer away and deviate from its status as object. And that veering away from objecthood is something that, that I'll, hopefully I'll try to get to. Um, I mean, I'm gonna get to it. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, it's always this horrible thing. You kind of think, man, do I have enough? Do I have enough to take up an hour? It's like, yes, I do. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure, but, you know. Oh God, anyway, okay. Um, but that doesn't mean y'all shouldn't interrupt. Um, so when I say that, so, so I'll repeat myself. For Dickinson, poetry was inextricable from correspondence. She, it wasn't just that she folded lots of poems into letters. It was that I think she was constantly trying to undermine the distinction between poetry and letters. And in this is a way in which I think it's not to say that Dickinson was unconcerned with publishing. She was concerned with a whole other idea of publishing. Right? She was constantly, I think, making her work public, but, that, but it was a public that was determined by these profound modalities of intimacy. Right? And, um, and because she was inextricably bound to correspondence, and because she was also what I one would call a regular writer. She was a daily writer. I even would want to say that she was a diaristic writer, right? Um, in a way that maybe sometimes we would associate it with the poetry of another great mid-century, mid-20th century figure of experimental po American poetry, Frank O'Hara, who was constantly writing what he called his I do this, I do that poem. He had a book called, I don't know if anybody likes that. He had a great book called Lunch Poems, which was just poems he wrote at lunch, you know, as he was wandering the streets of New York, engaged in various forms of really interesting, either aesthetic or sexual activities. Um, th these I do this, I do that poems were, could be conceived of as a kind of record not only of what was happening to him and with him, but also a record of his thinking, a, work, a record of what he was experiencing, a record of what he was seeing, okay? And also hearing. So that for instance, even if you don't know O'Hara, you might know probably his most famous, most anthologized poem, which is called The Day Lady Died. It's about the day that he found out that Billie Holiday died in 1959. And again, it's a perfect example of this, I do this, I do that, okay. Um, 
and, and I want to say something about, again, the place and the force of indeterminacy and irresolution in I do this, I do that. Okay, actually, I'll digress again for, for my digression. Like, y'all probably all seen The Godfather, right? So remember that scene where uh, it's Christmas and Don Corleone has just been shot? And the only one who doesn't know about it is my only one in the family doesn't know about it is Michael, right? And and they're coming out of uh, Radio City Music Hall. They just saw the bell. The, what is it? The bells of St. Mary's, and and Kay is asking him if he likes her better than Ingrid Bergman, you know, or something. And then she walks past the newsstand. And the camera stops, which had been tracking them, I think stops. And then we see her go back to the newsstand because what she had seen out of the corner of her eye was a late edition of a New York paper saying Don Vito Corleone had been shot, right? So part of what's at stake is this whole, is what it is that we can see out of the corner of our eyes, okay? Um, this, this I'll, again, I'll, I'll try to get back to that. Let's say it's, a, it's got something to do with corners. Um, Dickinson was into paper, because paper was special and to a certain extent scarce, and she was raised with like really intense New England habits of thrift. And so she wrote on everything, on all kinds of things. She didn't just write, she didn't just send letters in, in envelopes in which she thought that the envelope was a mere container the container itself often contained or had writing, right? And what was interesting is that the writing was kind of shaped and constrained by the shape of the envelope, right? So envelopes are broken up in, into corners, right? Or into triangles. And she would write on those triangles and, and she was a little bit random, it seems like, when it came to kind of, she didn't have a particular system as to how one would get from one triangle to another. And then sometimes she'd insert a third triangle into these two triangles, right? So again, the very materiality of the paper itself was, was crucial. And see, what I want to do is I want to try to make an analogy between the material conditions and material sort of resources that were available and that were being, you know, used by Dickinson for her writing and the material, social, but also speech conditions of philosophical inquiry or study as it was, you know, done, you know, in, in, in I guess, 5th century BC Athens. She explored the folds of envelopes as if constraints of size and shape were openings onto infinite scope. Did she insert poems in letters? or build letters up around the poems in order more effectively to oscillate between cryptography and cryptology. All the, right, where the let, is sometimes people read the letters as if they are a key to the meaning of the poems. But then sometimes it feels like the poems are a key to the meaning of the letters, right? What came first, right? Did she insert poems into letters or did she build up letters around the poems? All this surreptitious messaging is like a kind of trade craft. Do y'all all know that word? It's like a, it's a word spies use, right? If you ever watch like MI5 or, you know, those uh, Tinker Tailor soldier spies, they use the term tr trade craft to talk about how they do their spy work, okay? And I want to suggest that, that trade craft is potentially a useful word to consider how it is that she was constantly delivering all these surreptitious messages. We should consider if tradecraft might be adequate as well for all that moves in what turns out to be a really tight, all but immeasurably small relay between the love and the assertion of wisdom. Right? Sophist, a sophist is a wise person. Right? Matter of fact, what the history of philosophy is constantly teaching us is that a sophist is actually a wise ass, right? <laughs> Which brings a story to mind. Um, the great philosopher, maybe, maybe the greatest living philosopher, 
Judith Butler, who's often not included by professional philosophers within the brotherhood, and it is distinctly a brotherhood of philosophy, right? One time she came to NYU to give a talk. And I, you know, people get nervous. You don't think people get nervous, but they do. And she was nervous about the talk, or as you say now, I think they were nervous about the talk. And, and at the end of it, I think they were kind of happy to go to dinner and have a couple of glasses of wine. Um, <laughs> But maybe, maybe they drank the wine a little too fast, you know? And uh, I probably, okay, but this is, I signed a release. I know this is being recorded, but it's not gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be on YouTube or anything. But, uh, but <laughs> the, the uh, so the assistant provost at NYU, who was a kind of big theory head, you know, he, he had come to the talk and then to the dinner. And I don't know what happened, I don't know why. But he said something that, she, that, that, that Butler just didn't like. And she said, they said, you're a sophist. <laughs> she said it with like extreme contempt, right? <laughs> like, like, like it was the lowest possible thing <laughs> that you could be, okay? And um, it's funny because the reason why I think of it is because I believe that Part of what she would say, or they would say, if you excuse me, I'm sorry, I mean, part of what they would say if you if you asked would be, he was being a smart ass, he was being annoying, he was playing fast and loose, right, with these very specific and very particular and and honorable ways that we have developed over the course of thousands of years to try to discover the true and the good. And there was nothing more contemptuous uh, for her, for them, than that, okay? Um, a philosopher is a lover of wisdom, right? And again, the history of philosophy has been, I think, pretty adamant about this distinction between the wise ass and the lover of wisdom. And it has only really been in the last maybe 30 or 40 years in the work of people like Joshua Billings and before them, G.B. Kerfeld and Barbara Cassin, that people have begun to reconsider the moralistic division that emerges in philosophy between the love of wisdom and the desire to be a smart ass, the desire to seem smart. Right, okay. And, um, and so it is within the framework of that reconsideration that I wanna get back to trying to think about Gorgias um, in his relation to what it is that, uh, well, okay. So we have to consider the itinerant, all but stateless figures who are constrained as Gorgias and Socrates are sometimes by or as if or as if by one another, either to be or to seem to be concerned with how it is that they might advise the city, the polis, regarding right and wrong. If you look at the dialogue Gorgias, which I'm assuming that many of you have, or if not all, have you? You have? Okay, that's 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 so cool. <laughs> <laughs> You, you told me it would be cool, and it's cool. You know? <laughs> so now it's funny, right? Because now I know that you've read it, and of course, all it makes me want to do is want to like do a plot summary. But why? You already know it. But I will anyway, right? But you, but remember, right? Because like, there's weird stuff that happens in this dialogue. Um, it's like some, it's like some man thing they were having, you know. Like, again, like, you know, it, it's, it's hard not to, to see or hear or feel the contempt that Socrates has for Gorgias, right? He's like, this guy's a wise, he's smart, he's not really serious, you know? I don't like this guy, really, you know? And he, here he is, he's in my city, you know? And I'm gonna jack, I'm gonna jack him up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, so he, he, he says, look, you know, th that stuff that you do, it's not really, it's rhetoric, you know. 
it's, it's rhetoric, and, and rhetoric is separate from philosophy, right? And part of what's at stake is the, the thing about philosophy, what ennobles philosophy, what makes it important, what makes it worthwhile, is that if you engage in it in a proper way, it gives you some things that you can say to be helpful for the establishment of the state and for the state's own movement in the direction towards the true and the good. And you can't do that doing the kind of stuff that you do. You just want to persuade people of positions that you don't particularly think are true. You're just interested in the mechanisms of persuasion, right? And you probably just want to do it for some money, right? And we're serious here, right? And you're just, you're just a sellout. You're like, you're selling out thinking, right? And what's funny about it is that like, Gorgeous is like, okay, man, I just, I just wanted to come hang out and talk. <laughs> you know, you seem really upset. Um, you know, you're, you're like cross-examining me and I brought my friends and, and, and you, you don't really seem to be all that interested in anything that we have to say. And you're browbeating us with these questions, you know. Um, but you know what, man, go ahead. You, clearly you got something on your mind and you need to get this, you need to, you need to get this out of your system. And, um, and, and so Socrates proceeds to interestingly present himself as if he were incapable of fully adhering to those honorable protocols of thinking that for which he is a philosophical touchstone. If for whatever reason in this dialogue, he just can't seem to present himself as the one who is ignorant and who doesn't know. He is the one who knows and he can't help but tell what he knows. And it takes the form of this brutal oscillation between a kind of <laughs> What, what at one point uh, uh, Callicles calls, you know, uh, a, 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 a mob rhetorician, right? You know, an orator of the mob and for the mob. And then other times, and this is what, you know, Gorgias calls him sort of towards the, 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 the end of the dialogue. He just says, you're just a, pro you're just a prosecutor. And, and for prosecutor, you can sort of read persecutor. You're just browbeating us. And at one point, Gorgeous says, and this is the last thing that Gorgeous says, he just disappears. Gorgeous disappears from the dialogue, right? And the last thing he says is, just let him finish, <laughs> right? Just let him finish. And in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 pages or so of the, of the dialogue is a monologue. It's Plato, or excuse me, Socrates just going off. Right? And it's annoying, okay? <laughs> and the reason that it's annoying is because I think, sometimes I think I agree with him, okay? But I'll get back to that part later, okay? The point is, is that philosophical tradecraft has something to do with political capacity. It has something to do with the imposition of policy. Why is it that those who are so concerned with the difference between mere appearance and that which is the case are so committed to the shady nuances of the secret which thoughtful speech simultaneously holds and withholds? And again, there's this moment of extreme rhetorical trickiness that Socrates devolves into. I, I, I'm sure he must have been ashamed of himself. He says to Callicles, look, you're kind of just like me. You, 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 there's two things really that you love, right? You love the demos, and then you love this guy named Demos, <laughs> right? Just like me, I love Alcibiades, and then I love philosophy. And the thing is, your love of the demos will make you say anything, right? Your love of the demos is structured in such a way that if the demos says something that you disagree with, you'll say, I dis I, you'll say you're right, I agree with you, demos. I agree with the people, okay? That's, that's how, you know, my love is for philosophy, okay? And I can only say what philosophy tells me to say, right? That's a dirty trick. That's a dirty argumentative trick, right? 
My very desire is structured in such a way as that it only will allow me to proceed in the direction of the true and the good. Right? Whereas your desire is structured in such a way that it will just lead you to the rabble. And not only will it lead you to the rabble, it will lead you to the changingness of the rabble. When the rabble changes its mind, you'll change your mind. Okay? When, when, and, and what it means is you, you won't arrive at a proper definition. That all the work of division and collection that separates the dialectic from rhetoric, you won't do that work. You can't do that work, okay? Which is to say, and therefore you are incapable of the proper modality of sublation that will allow you to achieve, right? You know, what, what ultimately Hegel says we're supposed to achieve, this beautiful melding, you know, <laughs> of self-consciousness in the state. And, and it's, it's unfair, right? It feels bad that Socrates had to betray himself in this way just to make an argument for the true and the good. I don't think that Socrates wanted to be a state philosopher, but at this moment he becomes one, okay? And, um, and again, he does so by way of a, of a dirty rhetorical trick, okay? Um, what I want to do is I'm interested in Dickinson as a kind of potential foil because I don't think Dickinson is all that interested in what one might call the shady nuances of the secret. She's interested in this constant opening and indetermination of the secret. Right? It's interesting. There's potentially a kind of mystical content manifests its, that manifests itself in poetic practice which bears a secret and which might even be said to tell a secret, but which doesn't determine the secret. The secret remains open, okay? Um, anyway, this critic who I mentioned, Jan Bervin, writes, the gorgeous nothings, and that's with the E, is an excerpt from Emily Dickinson's manuscript, A821. In choosing it as the title for this project, and there's a book called The Gorgeous Nothings, which is collects some of Emily Dickinson's, what they call her envelope poems. Okay. In choosing it as the title for this project, I was thinking of Dickinson's own de definition for nothing in a letter. And here's Dickinson, and it's, it's one of her, what one might call scanned letters, a letter that partially breaks out into something that we would recognize as verse. By homely gifts and hindered words, the human heart is told of nothing. Nothing is the force that renovates the world. And her definition for no is the wildest word we consign to language. These gorgeous nothings are that kind of nothing, Bourbon writes. And she says that the manuscripts and the the, the, the envelopes are usually referred to as scraps within Dickinson scholarship. Well, what I'm concerned with here tonight is scraps and what has been confined to scraps, including this famous but not quite findable text, right, by Gorgias called On Nature or the Non-Existent. Okay. Not just Dickinson's but also Gorgias is nothing is the force that renovates the world? And what if it is also the force that innervates the world? Or what if renovation implies a teardown so complete that world will have no longer been possible? This is a fearsome enough project to have freaked out philosophy for 2,500 years. Philosophy has to be concerned with something, with some things, in fact, in their constant division and collection. And that dialectical motion is supposed to keep us on the path to truth and to the good. Scraps are problematic in their incompleteness. They are insufficient both as objects and as enablers of seeing. Though poets remain deeply concerned with the way revelation can still be held or held out by inadequate emanations of the sun. I think Gorgias had a similar concern. He decided to face up to how it is that obscurity might make or light away, even while fully acknowledging the possibility of being misled. Now, there's another little 
line from that manuscript A821, where Dickinson writes, afternoon and the west and the gorgeous nothings which I compose, the sunset I keep. And I'm thinking, gorgeous nothings which I compose, the sunset I keep, and I'm thinking, I was thinking, where, what does gorgeous nothings mean there? Okay. And then I, just the other day, I was trying to figure out what I'm going to teach next year. And I came across this poem by Paul Solon called Thread Sons. Thread sons above the gray black wastes, a tree high thought grasps the light tone. There are still songs to sing beyond mankind. So now I'm thinking, Thread songs. I think that Dickinson's gorgeous nothings are kind of like, are kind of like uh, Ceylon's thread songs. And what does he mean? I think what he means is those, those threads of sunlight, right, that occur as a function of obscurity, as a function maybe of cloud cover or of a window shade. You, you know what I'm talking about? The, the little the sun patches that your cat might, <laughs> might get into. Um, what, what, is this, what does partial illumination make possible for us? Okay. What is it to know, right, and emphatically to know in the absence of any illusion of complete knowledge? And what might philosophy have to do with that? It's, it's something that poets are always concerned with, and, and they seem relatively unashamed with trying to work through and think through this obscurity. There's another poem that it reminded me of, and I'll only read the first stanza. I think it's my favorite actual poem. Um, okay, and see, part of what I'm getting ready to try to say is, it's my favorite poem. But what I'm also trying to say is, is what I'm also doing by thinking about Dickinson in relation to Gorgias, in relation to Salon, and now in relation to John Donne, is that there's probably no such thing as an individual poem. It's my favorite poem because it seems so emphatically to convince me that there's no such thing, that there's nothing like that, right? It's gorgeous in that nothingness. It's a, called a nocturnal upon St. Lucy's day. Tis the year's midnight and it is the days, Lucy's, who scarce seven hours herself unmasks. The sun is spent and now his flasks send forth light squibs, no constant rays. The world's whole sap is sunk. The general bomb, the hydroptic earth hath drunk, whither as to the bed's feet, life is shrunk, dead and interred. Yet all these seem to laugh compared with me, who am their epitaph. This is amazing, like extraordinary poem, which is a kind of ode to nothing. And it manifests itself almost as a kind of attempt to calculate, right? You know how, I mean, y'all know, I don't really know, but you know how insofar as it's possible to conceptualize one infinity that would be bigger than another infinity, right? What Dunn is doing is attempting to conceptualize one nothing that would be less than other nothings. And the nothing that is the quintessence of nothing is him in the wake of the loss of his wife. Right? Okay. But, but what I'm interested in is these light squibs, no constant rays. Right? It's this inconstancy of light, the brokenness of light, the incompleteness of light that becomes an illuminative experience for him. Right? It's, you, you, anyway, you see. So, so I'm thinking that thread suns and light squibs and gorgeous nothings are all bound up with one another. Okay, now a slight detour. Um, I actually wrote this out, so I guess I'll read it, or at least I'll try. This will be the part where you'll, somebody will have to say, what, what, what? <laughs> you know, certain things, and what I mean is how things fall or fold or decay into a kind of sonoluminescent breakdown or dissonant confusion in which the last word or the last note or the unique name or the final declaration of unique namelessness disappears. 
those kinds of things become clear in translation, which insofar as it includes mistranslations, is more precisely referred to as a translational field or feel. Let me repeat in a different way and more emphatically something implicit in what I just said. Philosophy includes mistakes. Science includes mistakes. We can get at this by way of the English translation of a book by, um, by a French philosopher named Jacques Rancière. Um, and his phrase that is the, the subtitle of this book I'm thinking about, the phrase I'm thinking about, and please excuse my horrible French, is partage du, sens du sensable, right? That was bad, that was really bad. Um, partage, right, which is a cool word, because, you know, if, you're in, you know, if you speak English, you, you feel like you got it, right? Um, in part, or a partness, or a parting, right? Okay. But now, the people who translated the phrase, they translated it as distributions of the sensible, or distribution of the sensible. And distribution is, is a mistake, but it's an illuminative mistake. It's a thread sun, it's a light squib, right? Partage is probably better translated, maybe, more, more accurately, let's say, as, as, as sharing, right? And sharing is cool, because sharing means both something that we could do together or partake of together, but it also implies differentiation or cutting up, right, too. Okay, and, it, and it, it, there's both of, those, both of those meanings are there, and they can't be, they can't be, they can't be disappeared. Okay. Um, how far does partage shift from sharing when it is rendered as distribution? Consider this problematic of sharing. Consider then that if metaphysics is concerned with the distribution, of things in the world, or if, let's, well, I didn't say that. I was gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep from, sometimes I make up words, and then I have to explain them. So there's a word. The word I'm think, the word I wrote is animateriality, okay? So, materiality, right, y'all, okay. Anima, right, breath, soul. So, I'm, so part of what I'm interested in is the notion of the idea of a kind of animated materiality. Um, it's probably aligned with certain things that people think of, like, like maybe Jane Bennett, who's an interesting political theorist who writes about vibrant things. Or, you know. um, uh, it, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's, it's meant to, to allow you to consider how it is that things which one might, thought, might, one might have thought of either as inanimate or as soulless have some breath, some quickening, some life. And for those of us who study, you know, black history and the black tradition, you, you would probably be able to easily understand why this would be a thing that we might be concerned with, right? To, to show or to prove that things which have been considered lifeless or soulless are not that way but it extends beyond that project to a more general, I would even say, ecological project, okay? And right, so the question is, you know, what, what that translation does is it says, animateriality can be distributed, it can be accounted, it, it can be separated, right? And subdivided and, and placed within a kind of calculus that depends upon, you know, the simplest sort of conception of the number line. There can be a thing and then another thing and then another thing and that this is the way that animateriality shows up in the world. This is how it is distributed. One thing at a time. One by one by one by one. Endlessly. Okay. So it's involved in what I would call, or what could be called, a, a metaphysics of individuation. Okay. Partage does not quite move in that implication. It seems to suggest that there can be difference without separation. Okay. To use a phrase that a, a great scholar named Denise De Silva likes to use. Okay. And what I'm interested in okay, is, so when I kept saying, yeah, there's no, I, I know, I, 
this is my favorite poem, but it's not a poem. It's not separable as an individual entity. I know it because every time, because when I was reading Paul Salon and when I was reading Emily Dickinson, I was also reading John Donne then too. You see what I'm saying? Right? This thing, this poem that seems to be in this letter that Emily Dickinson wrote, it's not really a poem and the letter's not really a letter. They're inseparable from one another. They're entangled with one another. There's some spooky action at a distance that seems to be linking Paul Salon and John Donne. And, and there's a whole bunch of other people up in that party too, right? That, that I don't have time to, to talk about. Um, and we're all there too. Okay. Physics, specifically and particularly quantum mechanics, gives us some ways that we might be able to, to conceptualize or to think this phenomenon. But, but the kinds of, but the notion of the distribution of the sensible, as opposed to the sharing of the sensible, that notion is embedded in a kind of classical mechanics and a kind of classical ethics, right? That I think Socrates is deeply embedded in the process of attempting to establish in Gorgias. And what Gorgias is attempting to do is to say, wait a minute, the reason why I'm saying, why I'm talking about nature or the non-existent, the reason why I have to make a, make, make a kind of an appeal or a plea to this really scary idea of the non-existent is because my consideration is that existence and non-existence, and for that matter, being and non-being are what one might call distributive philosophical terms. The very idea, the assumption of individuation is embedded in those terms. Okay. And, and, and what Gorgias seems to be aware of, right, the gorgeousness of his nothings is all bound up with, let's say, a tendency towards confusion, a tendency towards irresolution, a tendency towards indetermination, which for Socrates, right, is tantamount to mob rule, to tyranny, okay, to, or at least, you know, it lends itself, it moves in those directions, okay. It's, one way to think about it is that it is this old political philosophical prejudice against indeterminacy that imagines that indeterminacy necessarily leads to chaos, which then necessarily leads to tyranny. Okay. So, that's why Socrates is so upset. He's serious. He thinks it's really bad, okay? And he wants to guard against it. He thinks that the force and place of rhetoric in philosophy leads towards these indeterminations. It's not just that rhetoric can persuade people to do bad things, right? It's that rhetoric can persuade people that the hard and fast distinction between the good and the bad, right, is something that it lives and works and operates outside of any, art, any capacity that we have to determine. And then there's part of me that one way to think, he thinks, you know, it's kind of like, if you ever get a chance, a great book that was totally important for my intellectual formation is a book, um, well, a couple of books that Noam Chomsky wrote in the mid 60s. One called At War with Asia, and the other called For Reasons of State. And it's this moment where he's sort of combining his philosophical and linguistic meditations with his political formulations. And he has a particularly vicious critique of B.F. Skinner and behaviorism. And his critique takes the form of an emphatic plea for human nature. So he's like, the thing about B.F. Skinner is he thinks human beings are infinitely malleable and they can be made to do anything. And what we should do is respect the fact that there is a kind of human nature that ought not be violated. And human nature, in Chomsky's estimation, is it's connected to the ways that he thinks about truth and the ways that he thinks about the good. And, and you know, it's, a, it's an argument 
for which I have like tremendous sympathy. Okay. But the part that trips me up is when, well, one way to think about it is he is also concerned all throughout his work as a linguist and as a political commentator with the distinction between what seems and what is, right? Between mere appearance and actual being, okay? Between seeming to be good and actually being good, okay? And you know what he has to do? He makes a case for what is. He makes a case for being. He makes a case for the being of the good. Socrates does this too. The trouble is, is that when Socrates makes a case for the being of the good, he uses rhetorical means to do it. Right? Okay. And not just any rhetorical means, but again, tricky, nasty rhetorical means. Right? Tricky rhetoric, he becomes a bore, he hollers at people, he won't let other people talk. He cross-examines because he just knows he's right. And he knows that what he's right about is good for everybody. Okay. And it allows, it requires, you know, this is the trouble. Can you, can you believe in the good? Can you believe in what is without making a case for what is? Okay. All right. Can you believe in that which is the case without making a case for it? What I think Gorgias does, and what I'm inclined to follow, is that he makes a plea for what is not. Okay. Which is to say, he makes a plea for a notion of the animaterial that isn't subdivided into individual units. And he's willing to accept the confusion and the constant differentiation and the constant indeterminacy that goes with that. Another way to think about it is, he's interested in the people rather than in the state. <laughs> he's interested in the people in all their confusingness, their weirdness, their strangeness, their won't do rightness, right? He will protect the people, right? Against the grain of the state. Okay. Now, what I'm trying to say, finally, is that Dickinson's poetry, similarly to Dunn, similarly to, to, to Ceylon, also makes a plea for indeterminacy. Okay. And what it does, I think, is it, it does it in this way. It says, what if there's something on the other side of the opposition between what seems and what is? Okay. What if the good isn't distributed and therefore diluted by the opposition between appearance and actuality? What if the good is something that shows up for us every day, constantly, as a problematic of our practice? Right? I mean, we could think about it with regard to current events, right? We could say, let's say if you, if you believe in <laughs> if you have a commitment okay remember there was a a statement that was made written and then published in art forum expressing solidarity with the Palestinian people a couple of weeks ago. And then, of course, the, person, the, the guy from Art Forum, who was the editor who published it, was fired. And then what immediately happens, what was that statement for? Why, did people, why were people so committed to signing it? I signed it. I didn't want to sign it. The reason I didn't want to sign it was not because it didn't mention Hamas and its massacre. The reason I didn't want to sign it is because I didn't want to sign a statement. I'm tired of statements. I've been signing statements and writing peti and signing petitions for 40 years. And, and they don't work. Right? 
Why? Why do people want to sign statements? May, and again, I think what Socrates might say is people have a kind of inability to distinguish between seeming good and being good. See what I mean? So I have sympathy with Socrates' position. Okay. Okay. But I also know that Socrates' position can be mobilized in the interest of a moralism that is utterly and completely not just selective, but ultimately a moralism that doesn't just, it's not that it lends itself to this or that state, but it lends itself to the constant defense of the very idea of the nation state. And we've seen how that moralism has been mobilized over the last two weeks, too. So here's my point. What if we decided that what we wanted to do, right, was not express our solidarity with anti-colonial struggle, but actually engage in anti-colonial struggle, right? Let's practice it. And we need to practice it because we're not very good at it, right? It has to become our practice, but we have to practice our practice because we don't do it very well yet. We probably don't even really know how to do it. We're probably gonna make a lot of mistakes. There are gonna be a lot of failed experiments, right? But on the other side of this conflict between seeming and being good, right? We could just try to do some shit, <laughs> basically, right? Okay, so for me, what Dickinson's practice is, is again, this constant practice of trying right? and failing. Okay? Constant embeddedness in an ongoing experiment. Okay? And, and, and that, for me, is all bound up with and is an actual expression of the gorgeousness of nothing the gorgeousness that accrues not to the attempt to delineate the good, to define it, right, but to practice it. And to recognize that our practice of the good will always be imperfect. Okay, um, okay. there's a lot of stuff I skipped and I, like I said, I was scared I didn't have enough, but I guess I had more than enough. And, I don't know. I should. There's good stuff in here too, but oh well. <laughs> I guess I'll. Um, I guess there's nothing left for me to do except say thank you very much for for standing up for me and for your kind attention. Thank you. But you don't have. To I'm assuming y'all are kind enough to stand up for everybody, so I know it's not just me. So, thank you.